This video is brought to you with the support of TrueFire. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested to help you get the most music from the least gear. In 1991, I was deep in my jazz years, playing my Fender Diakisco, trying to get through the changes to real jazz tunes. But there were still echoes of players I had obsessed over in college years, a decade earlier bouncing around in my head. Roy Buchanan was a pretty serious percentage of those memories, and at some point, when I came across a Made in Japan Fender Esquire Custom, I could no longer resist. The call of that double-bound body and deep three-tone sunburst was too much for me. I bought the guitar on a whim, and for the first time in ages, I broke my jazz habit of picking up a guitar, putting it on the neck pickup, and rolling the tone off. The Esquire was something of a revelation. In a way, it sounded more like an acoustic guitar than my hollow body did. The response was immediate, with the volume rolled off, but if you wound it up, it was easy to hear Buchanan playing the solo on the back pickup for The Messiah Will Come Again, still echoing in the stairwell of my college dorm. Of course, I couldn't leave well enough alone, and in my youthful enthusiasm, I had a local in tech install pickups under the pickguard. Then, as we sometimes do, in a purge to help me buy my first house, I sold the guitar. It's one of the few guitars that's haunted me ever since. So if you want to know more about the unique qualities of guitars and some of our heroes that have played them, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World Short History of the Fender Esquire. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe. If you've already subscribed, grab a hoodie or a stomp preset pack to support what we do. And if you want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up for the Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. The links are in the description. Unlike its Gibson one pickup cousin, the Les Paul Jr., the Esquire came before its more popular counterpart, the Telecaster. To get to the start of the story of these guitars, we have to go all the way back to 1948 and consider Leo Fender's goals for his solid body guitar program. In a 1976 interview with Guitar Player Magazine, he summed it up. I guess you have to say that the objectives were durability, performance, and tone. The tone was descended from Fender's lap steel guitars. The pickups and the bridge design for the Esquire was already emerging by the late 40s on those instruments. His decision to use six individual magnets passing through the horizontal coil helped enhance the clarity and made it sound much different than the P90 that Gibson was using at the time. Additionally, the narrow coil and tight magnetic field also contributed a brighter tone. All of this helped Leo's guitar cut through the mix. And remember, Leo was a fan of country and western swing music and was chasing louder clean tones in all of these designs. The celebration of the focus distortion from Fender single coil pickups was still decades away. And early on, Leo built PA systems and ran sound at times for local bands, and he had a good sense of what would cut through the mix. The combination of bridge and bridge-mounted pickup was seen as unique enough for Fender to file for a patent application in January of 1950 that was granted a year later for the combination bridge and pickup assembly. In that drawing is the very recognizable Tele bridge plate with three saddles and a pickup suspended from the bridge underneath. It's this bridge and pickup assembly that finds the unique qualities of the Tele family guitars, and it was from there the start of the first ones on the Esquires. Along with his design goals of durability, performance, and tone, Leo added in an interview in Rolling Stone magazine, The design of everything we did was intended to be easy to build and easy to repair. This explains the bolt-on neck design. It's been reported many times that Leo saw the necks as replaceable, that instead of refretting a neck, you'd simply swap it out. The simple design also led to a one-piece neck without a separate fretboard. The earliest guitars also had no truss rod. Leo wasn't convinced that you needed one and didn't want to incur the expense of adding one to the guitar, which would increase the complexity of the building the necks. 
The body design was also all about simplicity, a slab of pine and later ash with a single cutaway to allow easier access to the top of the 21 fret fingerboard. The first prototype, generally referred to as a snakehead because of the shape of the headstock, is believed to have been completed in 1949. When announced in the June 1950 issue of Music Merchandise magazine, the new Spanish electric guitar stressed the simplicity of the design as a major selling point. The ad marketed the easily replaceable one-piece neck, solid body to eliminate feedback, and the height adjustable pickup. Of course, there was a great deal of evolution in the development from that snakehead prototype to the production guitar. The neck plate would get shorter, the neck would become narrower, and the body would change from pine to ash, and shortly after release, Leo would be convinced that a truss rod was necessary as the guitars started shipping to all parts of the country where the weather was quite different from that of Southern California in which the guitars were built. The telltale skunk stripe of walnut that would be inserted in the neck where the channel for the truss rod had been routed was added. It seems some production esquires were produced without truss rods, and some of those guitars have even held up over time and some of these were also built with pine bodies before the switch to ash. The 25 and a half inch scale length was there from the beginning as well, and contributes to the shimmering harmonic content and tight punch of the low end. According to Forrest White, Fender's production manager from about 1954 on, Leo had told him that the scale length was copied from Gretsch hollowbody guitars of the era. But according to my buddy Zach Childs, Junior Barnard, who was Bob Will's guitarist, had an Epiphone Emperor that also had a 25 and a half inch scale. Gibson and Epiphone II used this scale length on many of their solid wood jazz guitars, using only the shorter scale of 24 and 3 quarters on their laminate guitars like the ES-175 and later the ES-335s. Leo said that the 6 on a side headstock design was created to pull all the strings in a straight line to the tuners. This was likely a copy of the Paul Bigsby custom solid body headstock, a guitar that Leo had borrowed from Bigsby. What is implied here, of course, is that Leo was trying to avoid the tuning issues of the three on a side headstock designs of their competitors, Gibson, Gretsch, and Epiphone. It's long enough ago that the numbers of the earliest Esquires produced are not clear. It's been reported that at that 1950 summer NAMM show, Fender displayed only the Esquire. It was shown with a black finish and a white pickguard, most likely concealing the pine body of the earliest guitars. There was a black guitar at the show. We do know that a two pickup Esquires with a lighter finish were also being built at the factory by then. There was any number of stories of musicians showing up the factory and disappointed that the guitar only had a single pickup were simply asked to wait while the guitar was modified on the spot to make the sale. This was simple because from the beginning the bodies used for the Esquires were the same as those that would be used for the broadcaster and later telecasters. The body routing for the neck pickup is already there, just hidden under the pickguard. A great example of this is Bruce Springsteen's famous Esquire that he used throughout his early career and is on the cover of Born to Run. Though Springsteen has said that it's an Esquire and Tele hybrid, guitar historian Tony Bacon has contended that it's an early Esquire with a neck pickup installed, though the pickup is supposedly never connected. Likely either a 53 or a 54, Springsteen bought the guitar for $180 in 1972 shortly after signing with Columbia Records from a guitar shop in New Jersey owned by Phil Patillo. Springsteen bought the guitar because he had had a Telecaster when he was younger, and players like Jeff Beck, Steve Cropper, and James Burton were all heroes of Springsteen's. The guitar had already been heavily modified by the time Bruce bought it. At one time, it had four pickups, and the space underneath the pickguard was routed out to accommodate that, leaving it as an unusually light example. Springsteen used many other guitars through the years, but he always came back to that Esquire. came from the back and forth with Fender's two separate divisions, manufacturing and their exclusive marketing and distribution company from 46 to 65, headed by Don Randall. Leo wanted to only produce the two pickup guitar, likely to simplify production, but Randall liked having the more affordable single pickup guitar in the line. As the guitars were getting mixed reactions in the marketplace, having a lower priced model likely seemed like a good hedge. By late in 1950, the line included both the single pickup Esquire and the two pickup Broadcaster. The Esquire carried a list price of $139.95, and the Broadcaster was $169.95. If you wanted a case, that was $39.95 extra. 
This means that the case was roughly 25% the cost of the guitar. It puts in perspective the noise these days about hard cases and gig bags being included with guitars. I reached out to Truefire to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. With over 2 million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, Truefire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5Watt35. Or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. I really like Truefire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Sign up now to start your journey to being a better guitarist. I'd like to thank Truefire for their support in making this video. I cover the three-position switch of the broadcaster in the short history of the Telecaster video, but what does a three-position switch do on a single pickup Esquire? In the forward position, a capacitor is in line, cutting the high end and providing a bassier tone. Whether this was to provide a jazzy tone or because Leo thought solid body electric players might need to reinforce bass parts, we're not sure. In the middle position, the tone knob was enabled. With the switch all the way to the rear, the tone control was completely bypassed, meaning no signal went to ground at all, providing a brighter and louder lead tone. Another very influential Esquire was the one used by Jeff Beck in his brief time in the Yardbirds. That 54 Esquire was purchased by Beck from John Walker of the Walker Brothers Band that was opening for the Yardbirds at some shows in the mid-60s. He paid 75 pounds for it, which was nearly the price of a new Telecaster's in the store. Prior to this, he'd used the red Telecaster that Clapton had played in the band that was owned by the band's management company. Immediately recognizable from the forearm and belly contours that were added by Walker in an attempt to stratify it and to make it more comfortable like the contours on a Stratocaster. I'll admit that as Beck is mostly associated with strats, I'd always thought it was Beck that added the contours. According to Beck, he kept the guitar until he traded it to Seymour Duncan for a Telecaster with two humbucking pickups during the recording sessions for Blow by Blow. He'd used that two humbucking Telecaster to record Because We've Ended as Lovers. Duncan kept the Esquire and eventually worked with Fender's custom shop master builder, John Cruz, to make a very short run of replicas of the guitar. After the Gretsch Company sent their famous telegram asking the fledgling Fender to cease using the broadcaster name for the two pickup guitars, things moved forward as the now famous Telecaster and Esquire models. The early blonde finishes started to move toward the iconic butterscotch we think of today in the era of the Blackguard, the years when the Tele and Esquire wore a black pickguard. And that lasted until the move to the white pickguards in 1954, the same year the Stratocaster was introduced. The changes to the Esquire model follow along in the history of the Telecaster from here until 1969. The neck shapes of the Esquires can be generalized as having a deep U shape of the earliest guitars, moving to a soft V from 53 until what is described as an oval shape in the 60s. That is a sort of a deeper C than we're used to today. Luther Perkins would use a 55 Esquire in his days with Johnny Cash's band from 55 until his death in 68. His classic palm-muted rhythm parts became a big part of the sound on Cash's early hits. There's different versions of why he did this. One was that his Esquire had a defective volume pod, so to control the volume he had to mute the strings. The other is that the strings were so low, the only sound he could reliably get was with the guitar muted. Either way, it became a big part of that early music. Perkins would go on to play a sunburst custom Esquire with a maple cap neck with Cash later on as well. Gilmore's 55 Esquire was nicknamed Workmate for its extremely rough finish that reminded him of something out of a woodshop class. 
Though it has a 55 neck, the sunburst finish is from a later guitar, as is the pickguard. The guitar was put together from parts over time in the 70s. It also has a Stratocaster pickup in the neck position. The guitar was very warm when David got it, but he's so attached to it that it is one of the very few guitars that was not sold at the Christie's auction when he famously sold his Black Strat. He used the guitars on all of his solo albums and is best known for the triplet delayed part of Run Like Hell from The Wall. Shortly after the move to the white pickguard, the single pickup was changed to have staggered pull pieces that followed the arch of the fingerboard. At first, they just raised the magnets under the D and G string in 56 and then staggered all of the magnet heights in 59. Compared to what we refer to as broadcaster style with a higher output and darker tone, the white guard's pickup has a slightly lower output that gives you a bit more mid-range presence. At the end of 1958, the bridge saddles were changed to the lower mass threaded steel. These were the standard saddles until 1968 when they went to a plain steel saddle with a groove for each string. 1959 saw the move to slab rosewood fingerboards with the rest of the fender line. Rosewood was seen as a premium product, and this seemed to be another example of when the folks in marketing had a direct effect on the guitar line. But the rosewood was expensive, and over the course of the next four years, the fingerboards would move from a slab with a flat bottom to an arced laminate of wood where the frets nearly reached the maple neck behind. The best known player of a 59 square has to be Duro Strummer of The Clash, which he used during their London Calling and Combat Rock era records. Replete with various stickers throughout its life, the Hunter Custom Shop recently did a very exclusive masterbuilt run of the replica guitars with a single Bourbon Street sticker at the bridge. As a 59, it had the early slab rosewood fingerboard and a deep C-shaped neck. The tuners had been swapped out to modern shalers at some point, but the pickup was original, and Fender went all out with a Josephina handwound 55-56 style pickup wired in the traditional three-way of straight to the bridge, tone control, and mud front setting. Reportedly, guitar was always one of his favorites, and he often used it, particularly in the later years of the band. Once Fender was experimenting with laminated rosewood fretboards, they also began putting out a few laminate maple fretboard necks by 62 or 63. Leo seemed to offer these due to demand from players that wanted a new guitar but wanted a maple neck that they were used to. These necks with a separate maple fretboard lacked the walnut skunk stripe on the back of the neck because the truss rod could be installed before the fretboard was glued on. But by 66, maple cap necks became standard as an option and were produced in large quantities for two years. Early in 69, Fender reverted to building one-piece necks again, with the skunk stripe again ending the maple cap era. Original Pink Floyd guitarist Sid Barrett used a 1962 Esquire while with the band. The guitar was originally white when he bought it in late 1965. In 66, he had it shrink-wrapped in silver plastic film. He then attached thin, polished silver metal plates that were in vogue in the psychedelic world of the mid-60s London. The only other modification was a raised pickup, which fattened up the tone of the 60s pickup in steel saddles. In 67, Barrett acquired a white telecaster and began using it live, though he kept his Esquire and continued to use it for recording. But in 68, he traded it for a black telecaster custom. After it was traded, the silver Esquire passed from memory, and its whereabouts remain a mystery. Maple cap necks are thought of as snappier, maybe even more assertive than solid maple necks. The common opinion is that like rosewood board being glued to the neck, it creates a stiffer neck and it's believed to produce a stronger, fundamental tone. There are always fundamental and harmonics, and that the stiffer neck makes that fundamental tone come forward. During the brief time of the maple cap necks from 66 to 68 was also a big transition time at Fender. In 67, the Clusen tuners were switched to the F machine heads, and during that time they'd go from the gold transition logo to the black CBS logo. Along with the upgraded fingerboard in 59, there was also a custom Esquire launched alongside the custom Telecaster. The move from the two-tone sunburst seen as standard on the early Stratocasters to the three-tone sunburst began in the first half of 1958. The sunburst double-bound body was striking alongside the new dark rosewood fretboard. So the custom Esquire had the three-tone burst from the start. The custom Esquire would stay in the line from 59 to 69. The early 60s also saw the advent of more widely available custom colors. Since the 50s, Fender had made custom colors available for an additional 5%. But in 1960, Fender published a custom color chart and dealers availed themselves of the colors, knowing that they would help get the attention of buyers in the store. 
The color chart would be amended in 63 when Candy Apple Red replaced Chill Pink and again in 65 when six new metallic shades were included. Stack session guitarist Steve Cropper was interested in a Telecaster, but had a chance to buy a 56 Esquire. It was this guitar that Cropper used on the 1962 Booker T and the MGs hit Green Onions and many others. He's been quoted as saying that he wished he still owned that guitar. Cropper would acquire a blonde telly with a rosewood fretboard in 63, and this guitar he'd play in the studio and live from that point on. In the house band at Stax, Cropper played either the Esquire or later the Telecaster on recordings by Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Albert King, and the Staples Singers. The Esquire did more than give the line a lower-priced guitar, of course, but with the introduction of the Music Master into a Sonic in 56, and later the Mustang in 64, there were other student-level instruments in the line as starter Fender guitars. With this additional competition, the original run of Esquires ended in 1969. Fender Japan began producing Esquires again in 1985. They built models echoing the 54, labeled a TES-54, in blonde butterscotch and a double-bound Esquire with a rosewood fingerboard called the TES-61. The 61-style guitars were initially built in both a faded three-tone sunburst and a black finish, but were later offered in candy apple red as well. They continued to build those guitars until 2015, and it's one of those that I owned in the early 90s. In 2010, Fender celebrated the 60th anniversary of the Esquire with a special production run. They did the same thing for the 7th anniversary in 2020. They make a special Brad Paisley road-worn Esquire with a specially designed Seymour Duncan pickup hidden under the pickguard. You can still get an Esquire from Fender on both ends of the price range. You can find endless boutique offerings from the Fender Custom Shop. Or you could get a great entry-level Esquire in the Classic Series 50s coming in that wonderful transparent white, two-tone burst, or black for less than a grand. And you can still find Craft in Japan three-tone burst 61s if you look but I try to not search for them when I find myself on reverb. Most of my favorite players live most of their lives on the bridge pickup. Robin Ford, David Grissom, and Eric Johnson often find their rhythm and lead tones from that pickup. And chasing these tones, I've become very fond of one pickup guitar designs myself. It's taken me just these 30 years to enjoy playing an Esquire-style guitar again. Instead of adding pickups to a T-style guitar now, I often find myself taking them away pairing things back to the minimum, to the basics, and loving the variety of tones to be had there. If I forgot your favorite Esquire player, leave it in the contents for everyone to enjoy. I need to thank my very good friend Zach Childs for his multiple excellent Telecaster and Esquire videos, in particular the history of the maple cap neck guitars, and for going over this script. I rely on Zach for the final word on Fender history, and you should too. I'd like to thank the good people at Chicago Music Exchange for their permission to use clips of Nathaniel Murphy playing a vintage 59 and a 56 Esquire. I need to thank Anderton's Music for their permission to use the clip of Peter Honoré playing the Strummer replica guitar. I need to thank my good friend Robert Baker. We've been trying to make a video together for a while and his permission to use the clips of his excellent music used in the intro and outro on his 58 Esquire were the chance. <laughs> shows what an Esquire can do in a rock context. Check out Robert's channel for more of that goodness. I need to thank my script editor, Perry McManus. Perry's such a strat guy that he tells me he's only very occasionally tempted to buy another Danacaster like the one he used to have. Thanks for hanging in there to the end, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, this is Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5 Wire World.